Hello, hello, and welcome everybody to the latest edition of the Wonder of Stuff podcast. After a week to recharge our batteries and for Richard to go off swanning off to Amsterdam, we are back with episode number 36, broadcast live on Google Hangouts on air. Um, this is the place, as ever, where you'll find news, information and commentary on science, engineering and technology from the past week and beyond, and anything else that interests us <coughs> from inside our tiny little human brains. And Ross is dying. <coughs> Choking to death. <laughs> Oh, you see, ever the attention seeker, Mister. <laughs> uh, so, um, my name is John Gardner, as ever, and uh, to help us out on the journey to knowledge, let me introduce my colleagues, Richard Smith and uh, possibly Rod Stevenson, if he's still around with us. Say hello, chaps. Hello, chaps. Hello, chaps. Yay! We're back. We're back. Right. Okay. Um, Anything that's in, piqued your interest other than the stuff that you're going to discuss tonight that uh, happened over the last couple of weeks? Um, I've been watching a lot of stuff to do with um, Hiroshima and nuclear bombs and stuff recently. I watched. Let's drag it down. Yeah, <laughs> do, you remember, do you remember a program from the 80s by BBC uh, called Threats? No? No. If you want to watch a depressing film, watch Threats. It's about a nuclear bomb going off above. Sheffield, I think. Um, but yeah, I watched that last time. Cool, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> it is interesting about, um, I don't know if you saw something went viral to do with um, the site of a nuclear disaster. I don't know if it was Fukushima or, oh yeah, it was Fukushima, saying about the the, um, the flowers that had... Um, oh, they had four formed. heads or something. But it seems like it's been a fake after all. Um, right, yeah. yeah. But yeah, um, I was reading a bit around that because I was wondering about it and you know whether that sort of thing does happen. And there's a bit about how leaves aren't decaying around um, various nuclear disasters, even 25 years after the fact, the leaves don't decay and stuff like that. It's quite interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Right, anyway, we'll, uh, we'll bash on with this in- exciting episode and uh, we'll come to Richard first. And Richard is going to discuss something about... Um, earthworms and I'm going to say drillo <laughs> or or alternatively dry low defensins. Yeah, I, I don't actually know because I've never heard it pronounced. Um, <laughs> Thank goodness. This, this is a new thing that they've that they've just come up with. I'll go for drillo defensins. Okay, we'll go with that. That's what that's the yeah. official wonder wonder stuff pronunciation. It's one of those things where you you would have you would have thought this would have been known for a long time, but basically they've never understood why um, earth earthworms are able to eat all of the plant matter that they're able to eat. So all plants have toxins to varying degrees to defend them from herbivores eating them. Um, it's part of the part of the chemical compound that gives them the green colour. Um, they can also use it in various parts of the plant to various degrees to put herbivores off eating them. So all plants are toxic, some very toxic, and that's why most plants are inedible to most animals. However, they're not inedible to earthworms. The toxins persist even after the leaves have fallen. Um, So until now, they've never understood how the earthworms um, managed to do it. And and this this molecule, um, I will not try and pronounce again, (laughs) um, is the answer, basically. This, This defends the, it's present in the gut of the earthworm, and it defends them against um, all toxins and plants, so it enables them to, to eat the uh, the leaf matter without coming to any harm. So what does it do? Does it just neutralize the toxins? Yes. Yep. That's right. Cool. But, so, but, right, okay, question um, is, obviously, earthworms get, get through lots of plant matter, various different plant matter, whatever hits the soil, they'll just plow through it. So that 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 drill of defensins must be must be able to neutralize loads of different toxins. Well, that the toxins that the plants use. I mean, oh. some will have specialist, some will have specialist toxins and poisons and things. But the 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 one the one that's most commonly present and is the one that's kind of other than like deadly nightshade and you know the odd ones that have these you'd find in the Anic poison garden. Um, the general poison um, is universal across all plants, basically. Um, and it's the one that, that, that helps them get that green colour. It's part of the chlorophyll. Um, but yeah, uh, and yes, you're right. They, do, they go through everything, and it, it's 
the the impact that Earthworm would have is massive. They've estimated that um, if Earthworms were to disappear, 23% of the weight of all foliage above the surface would disappear, um, because the, the 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 creation of the topsoil that that worms account for would account for that that amount. So nearly quarter of all um, of all plant matter would disappear by volume. And of course, you wouldn't get certain plants evolving because you'd have a sort of three-inch layer of dead leaves that would just accumulate. I mean, other things do, bacteria and microbes and stuff, do, do break leaves down, but not, not, not quick enough. That earthworms do. Yeah. So, so, I mean, so are earthworms one of these fundamental um, uh, constituent parts of the ecosystem, like, like, like bees, like et cetera, et cetera, ants and stuff like that, who, yeah. who you more take... So, more so, I would say. I'd say that, they're, they're, I mean, that it, it was Charles Darwin's sort of pet animal. He wrote a book about earthworms, and he was absolutely fascinated by them and, and studied them for seven years or something like that. Um, and that was after the trip on the Beagle. He came back and did that after. Um, but he's always, he's written about earthworms all the time. They're just massively important um, and a key to understanding evolution. And they affect evolution in such a profound ways. Like I say, the if you were a plant that needed um, light in the first sort of three inches of growth, if it wasn't for earthworms, you you just wouldn't be able to exist because you you wouldn't be able to get that light until you broke free of the of the dead leaves. And um, so huge in that in um, the the compound um, is very rare in nature. However, it's abundant in earthworms. So there's 27 species of earthworms in the UK, and this is where the study's been done. And They've estimated that for every human on the planet, there's a kilogram of this compound present underneath our feet in earthworms. So kind of like, eh. So, are so earth, do, do earthworms like are they everywhere? Yeah, like, they they're not like sort of like do they do they exist everywhere where there is earth? If you know, they're not they're not they're not just English worth, earthworms or Scottish earthworms. Oh, well, you know what I mean? Like, do do they do no, earthworms no, exist no, 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 in no, no, like? I don't suspect, but everywhere else, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they're on all continents. Well, dead, they're on all continents in all places. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, I'd be interested to look up about desert dwelling ones. I'm not sure about that, mm -hmm. but um, they're certainly abundant in the you know abundant in the planet. And 27 species in the UK is quite impressive because I think ants wise, there's only 30 or 40 odd species, and you think of them as a hyper diverse animal. Um, for for earthworms to have twenty seven, I mean, I can only think of two. I, I didn't realise there were that there was that much uh, diversity in earthworms, but um, but yeah. So is there, is there any any uses for can can they sort of extract this and synthesise it and use it to like? That's just what I was going to ask whether we could whether there's any uh, medical use of. Well, we've just discovered it, so too early to say. However, the 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 lead researcher who. Um, actually participated in a bit of a back and forth with people on the comments section on the Guardian. Um, he was engaging with people and saying, with people asking, where do you see this research going? Can you see any utility? And he, he said he had high hopes for it. Um, there's, there's, there could be all sorts of, well, when you think about it, to make things edible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, could be, it could be massive. Um, so, yeah, it's just one of those, you know, one of those things where you would think, you would just assume that that was well known. If you wanted to look it up, you would find the answer ten years ago, but you wouldn't have done. You didn't know. It's, it does seem like a sort of a fairly fundamental question that, that you know biologists would have been asking. You know, how do these earthworms eat everything? Yeah. But I guess there's I guess there's so many of those fundamental questions still yet to be answered because it's it's like there's not enough. I guess there's not enough scientists who are getting funded to do all these things. There's mm -hmm. just so many questions. Um, you then most people would assume that uh, they've already been answered those ones surely. Well, and also it's not commercially focused. The research is not commercially focused, so in the modern age, it's increasingly difficult to get funding for that kind of like. Oh, I wonder. I wonder what the answer is to this. Can I just go off and and of course in Darwin's day when you know stuff was privately funded and it was all about prestige and there was lots of discoveries made during that time, but. But now prestige isn't really a reason to go and do scientific research, is it? No. It was because it, back in the sort of the 1700s, hundreds, um, it was the the people, it was the lords and ladies who had the money, who happened to be interested in science, and that's how they got, that's how stuff got done. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, it's not like that anymore now because uh, the people who have got the money are are, uh, are footballers. 
<laughs> and uh, and they don't really care. They just uh, care about pimping their Range Rovers. <laughs> Actually, also I should say really that technology is a, is a reason. Um, this was discovered using. Um, High tech. It doesn't actually say what it was, but uh, sophisticated visual imaging techniques. So it's a new camera. It, you know, the might what is it? There's like a cross a cross section of of a worm, and um, they've got all the um, sort of like densities and that sort of thing. So maybe it's just that like 20 years ago they just didn't have the technology. So is this is this sort of MRI, MRIs of worms and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. So cool. I can, I can, it could just be that they haven't gotten around to putting putting the worms under these techniques yet, because like you say, um, there's probably 10 million things on the list of would be nice to do, and just it's just getting around to them. Actually, um, I, I've always wanted to do that. I've, if I had, if I had, if I was a multi-billionaire, I would get an MRI scanner and just put loads of stuff through it, <laughs> Not, just anything. Just try and find cross sections of anything. Some of them might be living matter. Some of them might not be not. not but it's like it would just be cool. So, so a worm is basically just one long stomach. I've never thought about what, what makes up a worm. Yeah, well, obviously they have they have got a massive digestive tract simply because yeah. they're constantly eating, and that's how they identified this molecule was because it was abundant. It's abundant in the digestive tract and not elsewhere in the organism, and not elsewhere in any other organisms. So they thought, oh, well, obviously that's it then because. Yeah. Earthworms have something and that nothing else has, and, and obviously this is it. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, they, they are they are just eating machines basically. But um, I, I don't know a great deal about earthworms other than when I've done this research and you know I've um, I've had worm worlds before, which is a you know where you put them you put them in the top and you can put leaves on the surface it's great for kids and you watch them pull the leaves under and stuff like that. But uh, I might look into the different species and. How they differ because I've got I've got absolutely no idea. Mm. But if it was good enough for Charles Darwin to study for seven years, it must be interesting. <laughs> and um, the one thing that I was always told about earthworms, but uh, is now proved to be um, well, probably was always proved to be uh, yeah. fixtures, was where if you chop a worm in two, you get two worms. You don't. No. You get you get a worm with a head that might survive and grow a little grow the rest of it back, but you. Only... I think both ends norm if it's like the common one that you that you normally see. I think it's both ends just die eventually. <laughs> so um, if you kill a worm, you kill a worm. Yes, <laughs> I think it's because uh, I might be getting this wrong. I think it's because they've got multiple um, sites for the central nervous system, so they they'll continue to move. Both ends will continue to move after they've been cut in half, which gives the appearance that both have survived. But I think if you observe them a few hours after that, you'd find that both ends have completely stopped moving. <laughs> it's a, it's like, but it's like lots of biological organisms. If you if you kill it, there's there are certain um, aspects that that involuntarily just continue. Yeah. You know, if it's like if you chop heads off chickens, they're supposed to run around, but they don't know that they're running around because they are dead. Well, obviously, what you what you get with with brain damaged animals is um, the the sort of um, primordial functions, so eating, breathing, things that just the unconscious part of the brain is in the is in the bottom of the head. So you can lose a lot of the head. That's what that famous chicken where it survived for God knows how long afterwards. It basically lost all of that function. You think how can it survive? But in the um, was it the uh, the part right near the bottom again. Um, the cerebral cortex. Stem. Uh, the brain stem. The brain stem's got all of that in it, so that's the sort of very, very top of the spine, bottom of the brain. So you can lose everything above that, and you can you can sometimes survive because you can carry on those basic functions. That was the story behind that chicken. That is a genuine, verified story. That one, but um, it just ha happened to miss everything other than other than those bits. But the chick. I mean, the chicken is dead. For all intents and purposes, this one wasn't. Yeah, no, that, chicken, that, that chicken carried on eating and walking around and stuff like that, and it was missing most of its head. Didn't make much noise. I th was it? Was it? Somebody tried to like basically kill it to eat it or whatever, and botched the job, and then noticed that it was still able to walk around. And um, but well, I think we talked about this on the show before. You said you said or... eaten. It couldn't. Surely it couldn't eat. It hasn't got. It yeah, hasn't got yeah. the front. It could. It it had the sort of top of its head off. No, no, that's um, yeah, but that's that's that. I'm talking about generally. Oh, if you, you completely decapitate them. Yeah, really, you can't survive. But what you get is nerves. 
the, yeah, the, the, the legs flail around and it happens yeah. in frogs as well and stuff like that. That's what that's what I was meaning. That was a special case yeah. where it, it was still surviving because it still had enough of its brain to do its... Well, that was the whole thing with the guillotine, wasn't that? That, um, that famous... Uh, you know, obviously... Are you talking the French Revolution here? Yeah, it's obviously bollocks, but people's heads chopped off and then they could turn and look and whatever, or, or like wink or whatever after the head was cut off. Are you sure you're just not getting confused with something on Carry On um, <laughs> French Revolution? Have you ever seen the um, Ricky Gervais, Carl Pilkington conversation about that where Carl gen genuinely thinks that you could. He's, he was like, no, no, I'm sure that you like had some eat or something like that afterwards. Like, are, you, are you. Think about it, Carl. Think about it. Put the head off. Had something to eat. <laughs> He's like, "Well, I'm sure she lived for a little while." I was like, "The lungs are not like the blood supply." And <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, um, so this, uh, dr oh, God, I wish they'd come up with a better name. Drillo Diffensens. Um, that's obviously one to watch, one to see, to study, because yeah. no doubt, if they found this, like most most of the stories that we cover, they'd have no immediate um sort of like out like uh, obvious outcome um it obviously goes down a, a new a new scientific research path and then we'll find something else out down the road so perhaps 12 months 24 months whatever we might get a we might get something synthesized out of this that we can actually use in in medicine or whatever well, as, a, as a standalone molecule basically it it stands to take the title of the molecule that is responsible for carbon recycling more than any other because it's present in earthworms, it's the thing that allows them to do that and that's how carbon is recycled in its various forms around the ecosystem. So it is that chemical, so it's got to have, it's got to warrant more research in the very least you would have thought. Absolutely. Excellent. Right, well that's uh, topic one down. Two more to go. Richard, uh, that was yours. <laughs> Ross, this is yours. Um, now, this is normally when I when I get this. If we if we if we all been really efficient, I wasn't efficient this week. But if we all been really efficient, we get the, the the topics for the for the this week's episode in about Wednesday, Thursday, something like that, midweek. And uh, Ross was very good, and Richard was very good, and I was very bad. Um, but Ross came up with this and said, "Oh, it's this thing that Noel Edmonds is whittering about." <laughs> now I had heard no nothing about this whatsoever, oh, and right. normally I don't I don't like to go in to die to delve into the story until it's actually on air because then I've already got some backstory behind it and I probably yeah. can answer the questions anyway. But this I actually did. Did you? Oh, I right. had a I had a brief look at it, and um and I was going to put out a, just a basic warning to everybody. <laughs> That this next story might have scientific inaccuracies in it. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't read it either, and all that no. stuff on my timeline about that he's now advising against Wi-Fi and it's a bigger danger. <laughs> I think or something like that. I was like, eh? I don't know. Yeah, that's I'm going to read that. <laughs> so anyway, Ross, would you like to tell us more about the Emp Pad? Emp Pad, yeah. So basically, yeah. So this is this is no legends, and I don't know why. I don't know who he was speaking to, but it'll probably been in the Daily Mail. Um, basically, he was talking to someone and talking about the fact that, um, in his opinion, um, there's something called electrosmog, which is a bigger problem in the world than Ebola or AIDS. Can I sigh already, please? Yes. Thank you. So this is basically the fog and mist of, of electronic things. <laughs> right? So obviously I thought, oh, right, brilliant. Load of rubbish. Um, and he was saying things, he was saying some interesting, one of these things where it's like someone who knows a little bit about science says things which you think, okay. He was saying death doesn't exist. Your energy just passes to something else. Which, fair enough, if you think life is energy, that's what happens with you. Your energy goes off somewhere else. Yeah, but you're just making the, yeah, but all you're doing is making the definition of the word death redundant. Exactly, yeah. So Talking to worms. He says you can't die and all this sort of thing. Anyway, so I thought, right, okay, I'll I'll look into this this EM pad, which is this. The first thing that got me was you saying there's this electro smog, fog and mist caused by electronic devices that is permeating your body, and the way he solves that and keeps his youthful good looks is he uses an electronic mat that costs two thousand pounds that fills you with ele electromagnetism. It's like, hold on, isn't that what electro smog is? But anyway, so I thought I'll look into this. Um, 
and it's called the EM pad. And let me just, I'll show you a wonderful picture of a, of a woman using the EM pad. There she is, lying down on this thing. And it comes with an Android, so you get an Android uh, tablet that controls it. Well, I have to say, that's a, when I first looked at it, I thought, this is just exactly like my little Samsung <laughs> Galaxy yes, tablet, yeah. to be honest. It doesn't yeah. look much different. So, so basically, you get this little Android device that plugs in. It does all sorts of clever things. And this pad radiates electromagnetism through your body and realigns your blood cells and, and all sorts of waffle. But anyway, it's apparently, apparently based on NASA technology. So NASA invented it. So I thought, okay, let's have a look into that. Um, so basically, it, they claim it's based on research done by NASA. <clears throat> so it's, it's designed to recal recalibrate a person's blood cells um, and readjust the electromagnetism in your body. Um, and what it's based on is something called pulse electromagnetic field technology. Um, and I dug a bit deeper, and, and the, the patent that they, they mentioned is this one in 2009, um, which is basically a patent that, that quotes another patent that was done by someone in NASA. So that's where the NASA developed technology comes from. Um, and what it was was research that was um, done to find out methods to reverse bone loss by for astronauts. So we, we've touched on this before in terms of like long-term um, traveling in space. You, you'll, you'll, you don't have gravity anymore, so you get muscle and bone density loss. So this was some, some research that NASA were looking into. Um, and what they, they patented originally was I, the actual use of, um, it was like a sleeve that you could wrap around a, a, a bone, like an arm. Um, and what they actually talked about was, let me take a screenshot, I'm going to cancel that. Can you see me again? There we are. Um, hold on, I've got a picture of this one. Hold on. So this was, this was the NASA patent. Richard, are you hearing um, some bad audio from Ross? Yeah, it's cr quite crackly from you, Ross. Oh, it was too loud before. Um, well, I'll continue anyway. Um, so this was this was the, the the NASA patent, which was this this sleeve that you could put around a an injured bone, injured leg. Um, you can buy what, those for boots, the five pound. <laughs> yeah, and what they were looking at was using. Um, electromagnetic force um, and the, the, the size of this force was 0.5 gauss so relatively, relatively large not that large actually um, and the idea was that it would encourage regeneration of, uh, of, of like blood cells and, and tissue and that sort of thing um, now so there, was, so there was some genuine sort of research done that, that they're linking this EM pad to now you'll notice that obviously this this thing that you're up around your body is completely different to what this woman's lying on. Um, and I looked into the the size of the electromagnetic field, um, and the field that the EM pad generates is up to 200 milligauss. <laughs> so it's massively smaller than well, not massively smaller, but 20 20 times smaller. Um, and to put that into perspective, it's about the same strength as the Earth's magnetic field at the surface. So basically, it doesn't particularly give you anything more than what you get naturally anyway from the Earth. Which is double. It. By lying on the ground and then lying on that, just double it. Yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Um, and to give you another sort of comparison, 50 gauss is a typical refrigerator magnet. A small iron magnet is about 100 gauss. So you'd be better just rubbing yourself with magnets, to be honest. So um, even if his hypothesis was true, which obviously mm -hmm. it isn't, mm -hmm. even if it was true, then the technology application to solve the problem is useless. Yeah, pretty much, yeah, as, as you would expect. But it is FDA approved. Well, at least, it, you know, sometimes crackpots come out with stuff that would solve it if the hypothesis was true. This hypothesis is false, and also the thing wouldn't even solve it if it were true. But, but surely the FDA approval only means that it's safe. Well, of course it's yeah. safe, because it's not doing anything. Yeah, but on their website you see lots of very, very definitive uh, things as to what it, what it does. It can lead to profound, widespread, and life-changing health benefits. It can help cells increase their energy by up to 500 percent, and it can help to jumpstart the healing process at the cellular level. So it can do a lot of stuff. Is there any it. is there any research done in in a recognised journal? I couldn't find any about the <laughs> end. I wonder funding. why. <laughs> um, but the, 
in the in the patents, if you go down to a couple of levels through patents, you get to like the NASA one that, that links to about it must be about 150 other patents, where there is a lot of research done in the sort of electromagnetic fields and sort of biological matter, um, and it, it does it does affect it, um, and it can it can encourage growth, but I think it's a lot more on the sort of a um, artificially grown sort of level than just lying on a pad plugged into an iPad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so unfortunately I don't think Noel's really on to anything here. Um, but, you know... You, you have to just grab a whole... You have to just touch a CRT monitor and then press the Degau setting and that will be enough. Not exactly, yeah. yeah. You, you just, you just use a it's mobile phone. It's oh. very interesting as well because not only... Because um, you think they're selling your pad... And they're selling the um, <laughs> Android tablet. That's what it is. Just an Android tablet. Only two thousand pounds. Yeah, and and interesting. You but you but but the, if you go to the online shop, you can get a, a genuine leather cla- case for your mm-hmm. uh, your Omni pa- Omnium One EM pad for forty three pounds. <laughs> it's the only genuine thing about the package. Yeah. You you also see you also seem to be getting a, an EM pad for a horse, which is four thousand three hundred and ten pounds. If yeah, you want, there seems to be two areas where it's mentioned a lot if you search for it. One is in sort of treating animals and horses. The other one is yachting. Apparently, people who are on yachts, they they, they would benefit from this greatly. And um, there's loads of yachting forums that mention it. And, and I, re- I read some reviews, and a lot of people said that you know after they lay on this. And, and had a bit of a snooze, snooze for an hour, they, they felt a little bit refreshed. And I thought, well, yeah, you would do, wouldn't you? If you'd made yeah. have a snooze for an hour. This is just a complete and utter scam. They're actually selling a digital to audio uh, to analog converter for 479 quid. And this is essential. Well, obviously it is, because you're sending electrical signals, so that's analog. You've got to get something back into the iPad. Sorry, the 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 Omnium pad, um, and four hundred and eighty quid. Good grief! Well, you know, other other, other um, magnetic field pads are available. <laughs> well, I, 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 this is um, this is my solution to the issue. What you do is you take out the um, the hard drive platters. And you put them on your head, and it cures all cancers. Can cures all cancers. Uh, can cure, can, can, and uh, and, and 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 they are patented, and uh, you can get these these. I call them the um, universal care devices, mm-hmm. and you can get these for fifty quid a pop. Uh, there you go. I just think it's bollocks. Yeah, I, I think frankly. it's bollocks. To be honest. Which, which, to be honest, it comes as no surprise. No, you can, you can get a travel bag for twenty-five pounds as well. So we just, should we just uh, get a big, get big, the big uh, pot that has homeopathy in, and just shove it in with that? <laughs> get it in room one hundred and one. Yeah, that's. <laughs> but so, uh, sorry, you know, no. uh, that's a, it's a decent. Uh, somebody's making a decent penny out of it. If uh, from, uh, but you know, from all of the people, and there was a lot of people on there. Um, who, if you're looking at the, uh, I was looking at the the homepage and it's it gives you some information and where they've done reviews of it, and amazingly the Daily Mail's in there. It's all best surprise. Yeah, and also, <laughs> and also fabulous magazine, <laughs> and uh, and uh, the Bristol Herald and Post. Any <laughs> science journals? The behemoth Ooh. that is the Bristol Herald and Herald and Post. Well, yes. Um, I, I think, I think, are we? I, I'm thinking it's placebo. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah, very expensive placebo. At that. Yes, ex- yeah. <laughs> absolutely. But obviously, placebos do work better if they're expensive. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, because you really, really wanted to work. <laughs> <laughs> Not just like, oh, well, it was a fiver. Mm. That's, that's why it's popular with the yacht club, though. It's nothing to do with yachts. <laughs> All the yachts can yeah. afford basically waste two grand on an expensive placebo. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> cool, right. Well, let's just leave that exactly where it is, and uh, and uh, and let's not come back to it. 
<laughs> in the future. Uh, so actually, oh, are we, uh, we're on to mine already. Um, okay, well, this one is... Um, this is a, a story about uh, a super volcano. Uh, okay, children, uh, settle down now. Uh, we're going to have a nice story about super volcanoes and mass destruction of the planet. <laughs> Ooh, yes, I know, I know. Settle down, little Johnny, settle down. Um, so, uh, it's Yellowstone National Park again. We, for those of the, who, who aren't aware, Yellowstone National Park is, in fact, uh, m the majority of it is, in fact, on a super volcano. Uh, and just to give you some background between super volcanoes and volcanoes, essentially, it's just the, the amount of debris that gets ejected. A super volcano, it has to be uh, a thousand kilometers cubed of debris getting ejected before you can call it a super, super volcano. And whereas a volcano will um, will get a peak, you'll get that you know the, the standard peak with lava coming out the top. Um, the these kind of become um, well, actually, I've got I have, funny enough, I have some uh, stuff here that well, shows you. A super duper volcano. I thought super volcanoes were just really, really good volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> they were or awesome volcanoes. Awesome. Apart from the millions of people that they're killing. <laughs> yeah. So what we've got here uh, is the standard. This is this is how a super volcano happens. So you've got lava, molten, molten stuff in the in the right at the centre of the, uh, the the core. You've got the Earth's mantle, the lower crust, and the crust. And what happens is this now this bit here is very similar to what would happen on a normal volcano your standard average good old fashioned volcano um where the 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 lava would come through would find a, a a crack in the in the mantle and and come through and build up under the the lower crust and uh, let me just and then on the next part you see you'll get a bulge now where is uh, on a volcano this bulge actually pushes the the um the earth up up and up and you get that sort of like standard peak with a with a super volcano you get little fractures coming through and that's where you get sort of geysers and um uh mud mud pots and uh hot springs and um gases coming out and that's what you get in in Yellowstone National Park, and that's why the whole the whole you know the whole tourism is is based around this, or a lot of the tourism is based around the geese that are coming out. So what actually happens eventually is that once the the, the steam and everything is um, is sufficient uh, sufficiently active, it actually co collapses on itself into a big sort of depression, and this is called a caldera. And this is the di the main difference between the two. One. Uh, you get the peak, and the other one you actually get a depression, and it's it's already the Yellowstone National Park is already in in a caldera from the last time it happened. Now the reason why I'm telling you all this is because things are getting a bit tense around the Yellowstone National Park. Um, so uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the uh, the park authorities closed a few roads around it because the, they had new um, thermal features appeared. Now thermal features are these. They're either the hot springs, the geysers, or the um, the gas ejections, and um, these new thermal features are coming up at about 66 degrees Celsius. Um, and what the geologists have found is that now, about 12 to 28 miles down, they found a new magma chamber underneath Yellowstone, which is they already knew where the other ones were. They've mapped those and they were aware of where those were, but this one is about four and a half times bigger than the other previous largest and uh, they reckon that there's enough magma in this chamber to fill the entire whole Grand Canyon uh, like 11 times over so what th th so they're obviously worried now the the, the last um, eruption from this super volcano that we had was 640,000 years ago fair way but and and that's that's reasonable for super volcanoes because they don't they're, they're not as active um as as frequent as as a as a standard issue bog standard volcano so they are they do take that a long time to come back up but they're they're worried that you know 
we might be getting around a time um, when this this super volcano is might re- erupt again. And if it goes, does it go? Does it have to go big style, or can it go just a bit? No, no. It, it kind of, kind of. Uh, we're talking devastation of whole of North America. So why bother closing those nearby roads? I mean, <laughs> well, that's, that that that. Why you can't just... come this close? Well, actually, you can't even come in North America. <laughs> that that'll just be no, that'll just be sort of health and safety, local health and safety. That mm-hmm. that'll just because. I won't want to be sued, but quite frankly, if it goes, who cares? Because I'm <laughs> yeah. not going to be around. Uh, but uh, the yeah, I mean, so the, there's a the huge there's a huge crater, and I did have a map, but I, I can't seem to find it of um, of the dimensions of this the caldera crater that they've got already in Yellowstone, and it, it's fairly devastating. It you know you'd, you'd wipe out North America, and you'd also create huge catastrophic life ch- and climate changing across the whole planet anyway yeah. so we'd all feel it one way or the other um but here's the thing sorry no there's absolutely nothing you can do about it uh so i'm telling you all this just so that when we all destroyed by this um and we're, we're whizzing up to our various gods or going down below to our various devils or, in fact, not doing anything, getting eaten by worms, well, if there's any worms left. Worms, they'll be destroyed as well. If there's any worms left. Uh, maybe we'll have mutant worms. Maybe. Maybe they will rule the new world. <laughs> you never know. One of those 27 earthworms might be living inside a volcano for all I know. But here, right now, this is the interesting I, 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 one. Because I, I was thinking, well, you know, quite frankly... Uh, how how wary do we have to be about this? And then I understand then I, that they gave the, the the American Geological Society gave uh, a chance of eruption in the next ten years uh, of between one and seven hundred thousand. That's all right. Where well, it's all right, but when you think of it, it's one in forty million if you win in the lottery. <laughs> actually better chance of it exploding than winning the lottery so yeah, there you go we'll take odds on that one i don't think so. i don't think william hill have, have, have got a book on that bet everything on it not happening because basically if you bet on it then there's no point is there no because <laughs> you'll you'll always i mean you'll forget you where you where you put your slip anyway because then in the when you're vaporized um <laughs> <laughs> you're just holding your slip now what what you need to do is you need to get onto Mars with your betting slip and if there's a chance that you go back and there is a William Hill <laughs> I oh, claim Mars, my prize the Mars 1 folk will all be alright then won't they that's true yes I'll go oh well dear me the Earth's been vaporised we've, uh, we've dodged a bullet there and then an asteroid comes and wipes out uh, and wipes out Mars <laughs> There you go. So well, I thought I, I thought I'd all end. The I've come in for for ending the show on it. Um. Ah, but I'm not. I, I'm not. I have got something else to show you, which it hasn't um, happened yet. Hey. Eh? Hasn't happened yet. Hey. No, it hasn't happened. Yet. Hey. No, what? So what? I was I was going to do. I was going to do that one anyway. I had it. I had it in the book of things to do on the show, but. Um, what I really wanted to do this week, and then Ross took the wind out of my sails by by handily posting it on Facebook during the week, um, is the wondrous picture uh, which we have received back from the telescope uh, that's in in outer space, and this is a place. This is a picture of a full the dark side of the moon. Uh, passing in front of planet Earth. Wow, I never, I never that. Have you never, you've not seen it? No, that's amazing. Now, it's an amazing picture, and I've got... Sorry? Not the dark side, it's the far side. There is no dark side. Well, God, you want to tell Pink Floyd that, then? God. Um, yeah, so, all right, the far side. I, to be honest, I'd, I'd called it the far side, and then I'd seen some what I thought were scientific publications called the dark side. Anyway, mm-hmm. it's the side that you can't normally see from Earth. And the, the, when the Apollo astronauts... So basically, this has never been seen by a human. They've never been... Because this, this was taken a million miles away. So um, obviously, when the Apollo astronauts went up there uh, in their, uh, and sl- they did a slingshot around the back of the moon to go back to Earth, they were so close to the, ba- the, the far side of the moon 
that they couldn't see the earth and it, they certainly couldn't see this perspective of it. So um, I'll, I've got a, a sort of slightly more enlarged photograph here. So, it, I mean, it look, to be honest, if you get to this resolution, it looks like somebody's done a very poor Photoshop job <laughs> because there's all these artifacts around the side. But basically, it's just the fact they've taken it from multiple exposures and they've um, put it all on one. So you get this horrible color correction around the side. There's, a, there's a, like a stop motion video type thing that I've got next to 20 frames or something. Um, and it's one of those things that it's not uncanny valley. It just looks like computer generated. It doesn't look real at all. Um, and like you say, it, it partly do the artifacts, partly do the fact that it's, you know, there's no atmosphere, there's no interference. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a weather satellite, isn't it? It's, it's a climate satellite. Uh, yeah, it is, and I can tell you exactly what it is. I have some. That's a tiny, uh, crater impact on the back of it, like, isn't it? Uh, that's uh, the Sea of Moscow. I think it's the Sea of Moscow. Actually, it tells you on this page. Yeah, so it's the uh, Deep Space Climate Observatory. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that is the that there is the Sea of Moscow. Let's just go in here. That there. Is is that that typhoon that's going around um, at the moment that you can see down there on the Earth? So let's go to the top right a bit. What, this one here? Yeah. I guess no, it must be. A, just the top right. Oh, this one here, sorry. Yeah. Um, it certainly is. looks like it, doesn't it? It's, it certainly looks like it, you wouldn't want to be under that weather <laughs> pattern. But I'm just trying to think where... where is this... I'm just trying to work out where it I is. Is that America? This here? Mm. Mm. I don't know. Let's have a just go down. It's very hard. Yeah, it's only when you see when you see Earth, a photograph like this, you realise how much water there is. Yeah. It's one of those things you see picture of the Earth that's not aligned like you imagine a globe to be aligned. Which yeah. Is you know, whether it's aligned. That well, that's, be that's because a lot of the stuff you know when you get it when you get the atlas, the atlases aren't all they aren't correct. No. In terms of the, the yes, you'd probably be you'd probably be able to work it out without the cloud cover, but that's kinda of like throwing you off, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, I think so. So I don't I don't know. I, yeah, you it could be America, but it could be anywhere really. Mm. On, on planet Earth, obviously. <laughs> but yes, so there you go. So I'll go back to the wide shot. Uh and uh it's pretty spec spectacular the fact that uh, well, I was going to say, I was going to say that no human has seen that before. However, <laughs> I've also found out that this seems to happen quite regularly. <laughs> They've yes. been taking similar images of the, of the of the moon over the Earth for quite a few years now. Um, but the difference is that it's you've got the full, the full yeah. globe of both of them, the full moon and the full Earth, right. and that that doesn't happen. Um, so actually, often. you know, when you were saying the dark side, I guess technically the side that faces us would be more appropriate to call that side because if it's it's tidal locked that way, isn't it? Is that what we're saying? So it's it's, it's yeah, not. that's that side of the, of the moon is always pointing away from the Earth. So the side that's pointing towards us is probably the one that's in the shade of us, then I guess. Well, because what do you mean because the the sun is well it's only 240,000 miles away from us isn't it so the light's going to only come in incidentally from the sides isn't it that's true it'll get less light slightly it'll be sort of like eclipsed by the earth every now and then whereas the other side's not but yeah. i mean when the sun's so when the sun's here and the moon's in front of the earth from the sun's point of view then all that sunshine on that on the on what they call the wrongly the dark side of the moon isn't it the full the full sun i know what you're saying yes so you're saying that because the earth is because the sun is when we were looking at that photograph the sun is from our point of view well the sun's either behind the earth in which case neither side's getting any sun um or if the sun's in fr in front of the moon that all that light would be shining from that perspective where the where the satellite is. If that was the sun, it would all be shining on the on the dark side, not on the on the side that's plate locked to Earth. The side that's plate locked to Earth is only getting the sun from behind us, yeah. So it's getting less incident. It's only going to get the incidental light then, isn't it? We're bigger than the moon, basically, is what I'm saying. So we're we're blocking more light to it than the other way around. 
It's also quite a long way away from us as well. So. I know it's well, a quarter of a million miles isn't that far, is it? <laughs> it's a, we're a lot closer to it than the sun. That is definitely true. Yay! Fact! fact. And anyway, that's what we like to do. We like to leave on a fact. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well... That is another exciting, excruciating, uh, sorry, um, wonderful episode <laughs> of The Wonder of Stuff. Uh, that was episode 36. Um, I'm still having um, problems with my uh, Google um, browser using Google Hangouts with a Google Chrome browser. Uh, so I was even con but, contemplating but doing this. Go back to you, yes. uh, you know, they're very busy. <laughs> They're very no, they haven't. So I'm still doing this on Firefox, and because I'm doing this on Firefox, I don't have any of my little um, captions that I can show at the screen. But needless to say, if you've got anything that you want us to discuss, if you've got any feedback you want to give us, positive or negative, please either um, tweet us, and we've got our Twitter handles on there, and also uh, we've got our email handles on there. I think maybe we've got an email address anyway, which is uh, wonder of stuff at gmail.com we've got a bl uh, blog at wonderofstuff.blogspot.com and on there you'll have all the other ways of getting in touch with us um, as always we'll do this uh, and we, we, we like feedback we'll still do it anyway so you'll not get rid of us um, uh, but it'd be nice if you come up with queries or questions or even want to correct us on a few scientific principles because you know we do need that from Tell time to the time Tell us the percent light difference from one side to the other. That would be useful. One of them. Yeah. Note point, note, note, note one. Yeah. Insignificant. But other than that, that has been the end of episode 36. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it. Uh, probably now time to say, say goodbye, chaps. Goodbye, chaps. Goodbye, chaps. Bye-bye.